I did that just for you, Ramon. I know you love it so much. Uh, this is Tom and Ramon, 100th Monkey Radio. We are recording this on December 2nd, 2013. And uh, Ramon, I think... Uh, uh, winter is getting here to western Washington. We've got quite a cold front coming in, and on my way home from work today, it was uh, kind of a, I, w- I was getting slushed on, uh, so I kind of expect that to turn to snow tonight, and uh, we'll get our first snow of the year. Yeah. So have you got any snow over there yet? No, we rarely get any snow here. Uh, snow. <laughs> we rarely get any snow here in uh, Japan. Uh, well, what, in Tokyo, I really can say that because it, it's been snowing since I think October in uh, Hokkaido, which is way north. Yeah. Uh, over here, it hasn't started snowing yet. Uh, we usually get like one or two snow uh, a year. So yeah. That's about bit. that's about what we get here in Western Washington, but. Uh, it never really hangs around very long. It's normally gone by like the afternoon and the next day or so. Anyway. But uh, you know, I'll tell you what. Uh, we've ha- I've had quite a uh, energetic up and down this last couple of months. And if you guys have been listening to any of our shows, I've been kind of giving you a uh, a play by play run of what's been going on for me. And uh, you know, I think that live show we did Saturday was good medicine for me, Ramon. I think it was really good medicine for me. It, uh, I'll send you a bill. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, so I was able to actually uh, vent, you know, express and get some of that, that pessimism out of me. I um, mean, you know, I had to get it out there on the table. It's just, it was, it was getting to the point where, uh, you know, without me actually being able to express it and get it out, uh, it was eating me up inside, so uh, I see that definitely as a healthy thing. And uh, the last couple of days, I've felt a thousand percent better, and I'm attributing it directly to being to, to my my hour long rant. <laughs> uh, so, so what you, you said you had something on the news there, Ramon? What's going on? Uh, just something recently I found out here. Um, and this is from uh, Japan Times. And basically, is uh, Japan the new Uzbekistan of press freedom in Asia? If you're living in Japan, you may be surprised to know that your right to know has been replaced by the right to remain silent. Shh! Don't protest. It's practically a done deal. Um, pretty much, if you you know like uh give out any secrets Uh, i'll read the second part uh, so you can better understand the first rule of pending state secret bills is that a secret is a secret the second rule is that anyone who leaks a secret and or a reporter who makes it public via a published report or broadcast can face up to 10 years in prison so there goes talking about fukushima (laughs) so Oh man, so what are they trying out this law in Japan before they try to bring it over here to the U.S.? Uh, well, you guys pretty much have the... Uh, or is this, lo- this something along the same lines of our, you know... Yeah, well, remember, now in the U.S. you can be um, put in jail for a classified law that you have no idea what it is. But, right. uh, you know, I, I brought this up not to 
make anybody feel bad or, or you know, be a doomsayer or anything like that, but we have to be aware at the same time of what's going on around us. So just letting you guys know. And uh, hopefully this might be something because it, actually this is making big news. Oh, it is? Yeah, because one of the um, senators, I forgot who he was, here in Japan, they were protesting this law and he was saying that anybody who shouts is just as bad as a terrorist. And it was like, oh my God. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So um, it, it's, you know, rattling people because that's one thing Japan always prides itself on. Have they got any kind of a whistleblower law over there or any kind of immunity for or amnesty for somebody who brings up, um, you know, some obviously, if they did, they don't now. Hmm. So um, I guess that would go to with any, you know, like NHK say something about Fukushima and we find evidence that it's BS, you know, things. Like right. That. Right. But anyway. So um, have have you seen anything else on that uh, thing about Skype where they're cutting off all the third party apps? Uh, I mean, I, I I heard you mention and you sent me that one article that you found that said it was that they were not going to do that. Actually, you sent that to me. Did I send that to you? Somebody sent it to me. But that's the only article I found, and and it's not from Microsoft. So uh, I'm curious on you know whether or not that was just a, a bunk article or if there's something to it because when I turn on the Skype it still pops up with that uh, that message it says all the apps are going to end at the end of the month so yeah. so this is this is this is just a, a heads up to all our our fellow podcasters out there that uh, you, that rely on third-party applications or programs to record or run any part of your your show through Skype uh, they're cutting out all interfacing with third-party applications and software. So uh, just a heads up, guys, if you are using that as a platform to uh, you know, share your truth, then you may need to be looking at other alternatives or other ways to, to do what you've been doing. So. Yeah. Mm, same here. All right, so, so I'm, excited, have... I'm excited with our, for our guest tonight. This is uh, we had a, a, a interesting voyage just uh, getting together here, and and we are finally here, and we're going to have a wonderful conversation tonight. We have Sandra Sneed with us tonight. Sandra Sneed is a recovering atheist. She met God in the basement of a rental house in Syracuse, New Jersey. A voice from her her eons from the eons, wrote a message in her journal, Unemployed? It is my assertion that you are employed by me. This moment marked the first day of, of, her, of her year in solitude in 2004, during which she produced 10 spiral notebooks in dialogue with the creator of the universe. She's kept these notebooks in secret for eight years until now. Uh, Sandra Sneed, she wrote a book that's called... Uh, what to do when you're dead a former atheist interviews the source of infinite being and when I got this book uh, and uh, it actually sat on my desk for a couple of weeks before I even opened the cover but as soon as I opened the cover it was like oh my word this thing I, I the the energy in it just just immediately the energy that was in this thing uh, there was a very strong attraction that I felt and I ended up uh, it, I think at four or five sittings that I actually went through this book. I'd read for a while, and then I had to sit down and think about what I just read. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's some definitely some very powerful and some very uh, thought-provoking material in here. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have this... Um, this sense about people and the authenticity and and uh, this this woman has definitely piqued my interest as far as the connections that I feel that she has. I would love to welcome you to the Hundredth Monkey Radio, Sandra Sneed. Hi, gosh, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Oh wow, thank you so much for joining us. This book is uh, was. Uh, like I said there a minute ago, I was absolutely amazed when 
when I started reading this thing, and it was just the feelings that I was experiencing while reading it. It felt good, and it felt right. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm, I'm pretty empathic, and that, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to express the way I felt about reading this, but it was awesome. And well, you must be to have felt the energy of it just by, you know, holding the book and opening the book. I, I have spoken to a couple of people who have said that, that they, the minute they held the book in their hand, they, they felt the energy from it. Um, I'm, I'm personally not physically that sensitive, so I probably wouldn't have but but reading words, I there are definitely books that that raise my vibrational frequency. I would I would say, and that's kind of the description people give of their interaction of this book. So so tell us a little bit about Sandra. Uh, I mean, wow, an atheist to boom, I'm talking to you. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, a little bit of your background, if you would. Uh, you know, where where are you from, and and how did all this come about? Okay, well, um, I want to correct one thing. Um, it wasn't Syracuse; it was Sea Caucus <laughs> in New Jersey. Oh, Sea Caucus! That's, I was yeah. going to ask you. I was like, I don't know any Syracuse. Sea Caucus. Yeah, <laughs> that's in New York, but uh, Sea Caucus in in. Uh, New Jersey is is right outside the Lincoln Tunnel from Manhattan. right right over the river. Yeah, <laughs> you're familiar with it then. I grew up in uh, Manhattan. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I but but how I wound up there, I was a, a photographer in my hometown of Kansas City, Missouri, and um, about age 33, I wanted to do something big. All of my friends were settling down and having children and, you know, starting their domestic life. And I just had no interest whatsoever in doing that. So, um, so I moved to New York City to embark on my career and dream as a photographer. Um, and then, you know, I had a, an amazing career, actually. And then seven years into being there, I had this huge collapse of everything. I lost a job that I loved and a man I was in love with. And during that period of collapse, I, I found myself completely alone. You know, in, in New York, as Ramon, you would probably attest to, it's so expensive to live in that area that <laughs> everything you do is about the wolf at the door. So you, your work is your social life. It, you know, you, you work to live there. And so when that was all gone and then my relationship was over, it, there was nothing. I was completely alone. And uh, to try to quell that feeling of panic and loneliness and, you know, worthlessness, just this feeling of, you know, nobody loves me, I'm worthless, I, you know, powerlessness, I mean, just an overwhelming sense of inner destruction was going on. And I, I would write to try to quell those feelings. And I filled up a whole spiral notebook of my emotional lament, this blah blather you know filling up page after page after page and then I opened up a brand new notebook I had my pencil on the top line and before I knew that the pencil was moving it stopped and I looked down and what was written on the page was unemployed question mark it is my assertion you are employed by me and so this notebook that I had been spilling my guts out to suddenly started talking to me and making contact with me. And, uh, and then that began my year of solitude where I filled up 10 spiral notebooks. Wow, so um, you didn't just throw your pencil down and run out of the room going, oh my God, this is weird? <laughs> no, there was just something about it that, drew me it was as if the 
rabbit hole just kind of opened up and I was in a position to want to know, you know, how deep does that go? What is this? What's, you know, what is this? Trying to make, a, you know, it was a very clear communication and the communication was some of some authority, you know, um, that you're employed by me is something completely different than, say, um, some ghost wanting to communicate with you, like, hi, my name is Ralph. Right. You know, um, it's just a completely different feeling um, in that state of mind that I was in mm -hmm. that drew me to it. So at this moment when you were writing, were you still an atheist? Yes. Yes, absolutely I was. Uh, you know, at that moment, though, I would say that an inner part of me began to let go of any preconceived ideas of any kind. You know, there was no intellectual thought as to or skepticism that could come over me intellectually. Because, you know, one thing that people don't realize, when you're completely alone over a period of days, you can become so inwardly focused that you lose your identity because there's nothing reinforcing what you are. Mm. You know, it. you lose... There's, yeah. uh, there's, there's just something that happens to you where you lose what you think you are. Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I can understand that because I spend, uh, well, I wasn't alone, but uh, did like a 10 day silent meditation where you weren't allowed to interact with anybody, mm. even look at them in the eyes. And for myself, by the 60, you did this for a year, correct? Yeah. So for myself, by the sixth day, I, I just felt completely nuts, like completely out of my mind. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. So you so you know that feeling, you know. So you're already in a place of questioning your sanity. So when there's nobody around to question you, then you have nothing to protect. And it's in that l lack of protection f from your inner world that you began to discover what's beyond your senses. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's like uh, this isolation becomes literally like an isolation tank where your senses are removed. So external sensation is isn't there right right so from from that point um you know i've i've dabbled in several different modalities trying to to uh you know find something that worked really well for me for that communication to god or to higher self to uh you know whatever we want to call this yeah um and and I have tried to, the the automatic writing thing and have never had any success at it because I, I keep getting in the way myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just curious on on uh, how that manifested for you. Did it just come, uh, just was it a automatic flow for you or did you actually have, uh, did you was there work involved on your end trying to get yourself out of the way as you were, as you were uh, relaying this this uh, information, yeah, I'd say what was a really good mechanical lesson. Um, I I had read the book years before. I read I read the book The Artist's Way, and in that she had an exercise where you are to write over a period of time every day, say ten minutes, and then you build up ten minutes, twenty minutes, thirty minutes where you just write nonstop and you keep writing and keep writing. And I, I would say by the end of that spiral notebook, so there's about a hundred pages in a spiral notebook. So by that, that well, hundred, 
monkey, 100 pages, interesting. <laughs> um, so by the end of that 100 pages, I had completely detached my editor. Mm. You know, that mm. inner editor is what keeps stopping you whenever you write from within. Yeah, I can't so, stand that guy. Sorry? I can't stand him. Yes. The <laughs> will definitely definitely uh, destroy any good piece of prose for sure if you let him um, that that editor but when you let that editor go completely that's when something else has opportunity to happen so I think if you try that method mm. you might you might have another chance at it mm, interesting so d but as for, as far as your uh, process, uh, was there? Did you have to work through it to get going, or did it just? Were you able to set that inner editor, as you call it, off to the side immediately? Well, you know that's a good question. I'm not sure that I've analyzed at what point it became a um, monologue to a dialogue. Actually, for the for that year, it never was a dialogue. Uh, this book that I have out, uh, What to Do When You're Dead, a former atheist interviews the source of infinite being. Now, that book I sat down in 2011 to write purposely for publication. These 10 notebooks I have yet to publish. I'm not sure when I will. Probably when people know, enough people know who I am so that the when the spiral notebooks are published people have a place to go for a deeper understanding because it's very complex work um god would give me riddles to try to solve uh, god was completely reprogramming me reorienting my perspective when you know normally when we kind of uh, establish who we are, we are taking the outside world, comparing it to who we are, and then deciding what is me, what is not me, based on what we observe in the outside world, um, you know, through media, friends, family, outside stimulus. And so these, these spiral notebooks, though, were all about God teaching me the inner world, the inner being, where the outside world had nothing to do with this eternal being I was learning about that is me. And um, and so there's a lot of lessons in, in these spiral notebooks that I really want to give people a platform to be able to, to have help with. But I think I've gotten off the point. There was, there was a question you asked and I, oh, yes. It's about my process. My process now is simply a manner, a matter of turning my attention to a part of my brain that can listen to God. Um, can first, it started through my arm and my hand. That's why I call myself a God scribe, because the. The vibrational signature of this being we call God is this huge wave of being that runs through every cell of the universe. And my cells were made to do this. Um, I've, I've since found out that I was born to do this. And so my cells were programmed to be able to do this. So my arm kind of there was a there was a unity that happened with my arm and hand and pen and just as you would re remember these pencils where there would be a pen on one side or a stylus on one side and there'd be a pen on the other side and you would trace a picture and on the paper on the other side of this arm would draw what you're tracing in a sense, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so in a sense, that's kind of what was happening 
my body was recording in resonance this vibrational resonance it was record hand was recording in resonance so it really wasn't like automatic writing i like to make a distinction there um automatic writing is associated with channeling channeling is literally when a spirit entity is co-inhabiting the body of the medium and pushing that pen or pencil okay so that's it feels automatic to the medium but it's it's really another entity entity pushing right. uh, or communicating through that. What I'm doing, you can't you can't channel God. You would blow up with any attempt to try to channel this great mm. being. Instead, what's happening is your is my body works in resonance with it uh, with this vibrational signature and how. God explains it is that we well that's another question we'll get to that in a minute I I want to pause here and let you ask questions so I don't <laughs> oh, go off on a tangent no actually go ahead and keep going I'm curious yeah <laughs> well okay so I moved from scribing over um, I'm not sure how long it was if it was a month a few weeks or what it was one day it was lightning and thunder and storming outside. And I went down to write as had become my habit to communicate with God. And what comes out is I do not end with this pen. And I didn't get it. You know, I didn't, I didn't get what that meant. So God said it again. I do not end with this pen. And it became a little bit more emphatic and I still didn't quite get it. And then the third time, I do not end with this pen. And there was a lightning bolt outside that was so loud and bright. It lit up the house and it actually um, struck the walnut tree in the backyard. And the top part of the tree fell to the ground. Hmm. And I, that scared me. And I ran upstairs, um, <laughs> you know, just shaking because, you know, it's one thing to sense God's presence in the quiet of your writing in the basement in your mind, you know, hearing, right. you know, feeling God in your mind. And it's another to sense God in the backyard. Right. You know? have, have him, you know, throwing lightning bolts at your tree. <laughs> right. <laughs> affecting, you know, affecting material right. matter in some way. So that's when I got the message that I need to expand my understanding of God or no, communication with God. And so I started to open my mind to hearing God. And then when I started doing that, I would hear my own voice, but it was God's words. And I was laying in bed. When, the, when this first started happening, I laid in bed and I saw this image where I was inside a cavern, like this giant cave, and I was down on the floor of this cave and there was water up to my eyeballs, like I'm underwater up to my eyeballs. And I looked up and there was this rope hanging from the center of the cavern. So it was as if it was saying, I not only came to the end of my rope, I have fallen off of it, right? And I'm underwater. Um, and then I, in my mind, said, hello. And there was this huge echo off of it. It said, hello, hello, hello. And it's, that frightened me. And I said, that voice frightens me. And I heard God say, you will learn to love it. So this is this <laughs> you this is this self that I my self, this this self that I really am, the truly am, I was discovering within this cavern and then it I don't know how to describe it. Then then it became the place where God began talking to me through 
my auditory, internal auditory mechanisms. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah, this stuff is, there. it is, I have found uh, describing some of these experiences and sensations to other people, one of the most challenging things that I've ever done. You know, getting, uh, wrapping some of these things up into words that can't describe them sufficiently is, uh, you know, is probably one of the biggest stumbling blocks that we have right here on the planet right now is, is relaying this information in an understandable way, you know. Right. Well, but you've said that you kind of sounded like devoured the contents of this book, and oh. that's kind of rare. I mean, a lot of people say that they there's a lot they don't get. So I'm I'm curious, uh, you know, what's kind of struck you in it? Uh, you know, probably uh, the the thing I liked the most about the the dialogue was the dialogue was the fact that uh, you were you were put on the spot to answer the questions that you knew you already somewhere inside knew, and I was really impressed with the way that God pulled the answers out of you. Yeah. You know, I that that just totally just, just totally impressed me, and 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 I resonated with that so much because it seems like through my experiences that's what happens to me. I mean, I'll beat my head against the wall trying to understand something or get something, you know, and and uh, you know I'll go into into my meditations and prayer and go, okay, God, you know what's going on here, and and eventually I figure it out myself, and and I get that feeling like. Uh, or that that uh, pat on the back, you know, that that uh, uh, etheric pat on the back that says, "I knew you could do it." Yeah. And um, so that's prob- probably, I mean, the just just the whole tenor of the way it was, um, it, it came across was uh, absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. That's cool to hear that you also have your your own conversations with God. And I know what you mean, where you feel the elation from God, the pride, and you feel it. It's like the communication comes all at once. Right. It, the, the big download, and then it takes a, uh, takes a while to unpack exactly what just happened. <laughs> right. Right. It, because we have to form it into our words, right? To the the egoic mind has to put, you know, uh, stretch it out into some linear fashion to uh, describe it to ourselves. Right. right. And that's something I also had to learn to do as a scribe is to allow the filter of language to work because you know and like in this book there's a glossary in the front to just try to help people orient their their minds to the way that God uses words and so God will use some words over and over again because there's so many different ways to use them and one of those words is way way is we use the word way to kind of describe a manner of something. The way you do something is is how we describe it. But the way God uses way is similar to how your, your uh, dendritic mechanisms like the circulatory system or, well, let's just say the circulatory system Every vein and vessel and ventricle, these are ways. So, like a waterway. Right. And if you look at things the way, the way that God looks at them, the way a creator looks at them, you experience words very differently. There's another, and and I've al- I have always kept a dictionary with the etymological 
um, meanings in in the book. So the so the definitions always begin with the origin of words. And the word worry, for instance, is a word that comes from what a dog does to a bone when it chews it until it's gone. It's chewing and chewing and chewing until it's gone. That's what we do with worry. We chew on something until we wither ourselves away. We worry it and worry it and worry it. So it's a very important word for for God, for us to understand, because there is a literal and symbolic meaning. The literal is that we can worry ourselves to death. We create, we create disease in our heart from worry because of the lesions that we can put on our heart from by from worry and then in those lesions disease is able to take hold and that's what weakens the heart and causes uh, heart disease first from heart illness um, right. so uh, so the point of that was about filtering information that comes from God requires a prepared mind and that takes a lot of work to get there. Mm, yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, I've been on this, I've been on this path myself for, geez, what, twenty-seven years now. And wow. uh, so, you know, the whole. Uh, what sparked I, yours? I, I'm sorry. What sparked <laughs> yours? What sparked mine? Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, so there's a reason why I'm laughing. Uh, I guess so. Well, I had a. Uh, uh, I started having all sorts of bizarre things happen, you know, the synchronicities that were so blatant and in your face. Uh, there was something weird going on. And, and I was the type of guy that was, uh, religion was created to control the masses. Right. Now, I was agnostic, definitely agnostic. I, I didn't not believe that there was something out there, but I, by no means did I actively pursue anything spiritual. Mm -hmm. But... I started having all sorts of bizarre things happening to me, and uh, you know, I was I was outside of the society's law, and and I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing by their laws, and so, anyways, I I ended up getting arrested, and uh, that kind of, uh, uh, and this is around. There's a whole ton of different events that happened through this period of time. Uh, but then this, I ended up uh, moving to from San Bernardino, California, to Palm Springs, and while in Palm Springs, uh, my house mysteriously burned to the ground, mm. and I absolutely lost everything except for my truck and the clothes on my back. Mm. And I had a wife who was pregnant, and uh, you know it was I was living paycheck to paycheck, renting a house. Uh, so things things weren't really rosy in in the life of Tom, and the house burning to the ground took me to my knees. And in the middle of the burned out house, I got down on my knees, tears streaming down my face, and I I was like, God, what the hell is going on here? Hmm. And that that was that was actually the two by four that hit me upside the head, and from there it was uh, oh wow the next couple of years from there was absolute whirlwind uh, my experience in jail was uh, I, I I was wow my experience in jail was uh, absolutely amazing I went to a school that was uh, far and above anything that I ever dreamed dreamt was possible to happen inside a jail mm. <laughs> so mm. uh, I learned a tremendous amount in a very very short period of time, uh, I ended up being going uh, headlong into the Messiah complex. Uh, you know, I I was I was the returning you know Jesus Christ, and mm. uh, I experienced that for almost a full two years, and before before something right out of the Bible that that I was was thumping to around to everybody. Uh, something right out of the Bible was able to 
uh, well, I was guided to, uh, that actually made me actually look past Christianity and open my mind a little bit more. And it was it had it had to do with that that one passage in that says, uh, "No man can reach the Father but through the Son." Mm-hmm. And I actually I did a little bit of a, you know I I broke the words down. I broke things down and actually looked at each one of those words. And I when I read it uh, again, I had the the full blown cinematic. Thing popping into my brain and I saw I saw myself walking through a door and that door was uh, that door was the Sun mm-hmm. uh, and when I got through the door I looked over my shoulder and there was the door but in front of me was a wide open Vista so I, that taught me that okay well I've gone through this and all right, I, I, you know, I went through the sun. Now I can reach the reach the Father, and that that That's actually amazing. helped helped me to snap out of the whole Messiah complex and out of the out of the uh, Christianity thing where I was, you know, um, you know, there's there's a tremendous amount of of amazingly. Uh, soulful and and energetic teachings within that book if read and perceived from the right perspective Mm -hmm. Uh, but if it's if it's done from that dogmatic uh, I'm doing this because I'm it's expected of me attitude then there's that's where the problems lie within that but Uh, yeah and it's it's interesting I mean, so many things of what you said are interesting and very similar to my own experience. But, you know, um, God is helping me back to the words thing. The word evil, for instance, God has said that that word has been misunderstood for hundreds of years now, for centuries. But the word evil is a Germanic word, ubel, which means up from under. And what it refers to evil is just without love when you pull love away what's left is evil but it's Mm -hmm. not like some entity is in of itself evil that's very rare to have something that's pure evil the um the evil that we get into is when we do things without love right and the uh perspective of love when everything is seen through the perspective of love then you see what what when you said through the i also broke down that passage about uh, no one gets to the father except through me um what jesus was saying in my eyes is um at the time of this rabbinical rule where they believed that, you know, only through the temple that God, you know, can can only be achieved through this piousness and this righteousness. Right. And, um, and, and Jesus was saying, no, it's through me, through the self. There is no other authority over me than God. And through me, that's where God is. And, and what Christianity has done, though, is said... Um, you can't, you can't get to the Father except through Him, and what He meant was me, the self. All of us have the self that we are walking through to get to God. Right. You know, it, it's um, and the and the word Christ. God has told me that the word Christ meant God on earth, and the and Christmas, Christmas, since we're getting close to the holiday. This has kind of been a new message. Um, Christmas actually meant Christness, and the birth of Christ is within us, not a baby in a manger, right? It's um, the birth of Christ through through us isn't about Jesus. It's about our being God on earth through yeah. kindness. Kindness is kinship, kinship with God. We are. Uh, sons and daughters of God so we are akin to God 
And it is in our kinship that we achieve kindness. And it's in that kindness that we achieve Christness. Mm. And it's the, in the, and that is the kindness is the birth of Christ within us because we start to see the world and people within it as our own brethren, as our own relation and our own relationship. Mm. That's what Jesus meant when he said, um, treat not only treat others as you would have them treat you, but uh, treat your neighbor as yourself. Right. Love your neighbor as yourself because you are in kinship with your neighbor because they are yourself. They are you. Hmm. Through God, through Christ, through the through the Christness that is God on earth. Right. For that for that whole concept and idea to keep keep that within my within my consciousness or or you know to express that I fell in love with the with the word namaste. Yes. Uh, yes. And that's my yeah. That's my fav- favorite at this moment is because it's it kind of encompasses all all and everything to the way that I see it. And, uh, you know, being able to, the, the, I mean, the divine in me sees the divine in you. Mm-hmm. And how that, it, that's just so beautiful. That, uh, yeah. I remember seeing people that, I remember seeing this even when I was an atheist. I remember seeing people like Mormons, for instance, I would look in their eyes and I would see something there, but I didn't know what it was. But it was kind, it was warm, it, it smiled, and it smiled in a knowing way. And uh, I later found out that Mormons don't use the cross as their symbol. They believe that people should see Jesus through you, or she should see Christ through you and your deeds. And um, so they, they like embody that um, that Christness without a symbol mm. like a cross. Mm. Yeah. Ramon, what about you? You said you went through how how long of a period of meditation? Uh, no, I went to this um, this place called Vishpashana, and they're like all over the United States and the world. And I spent ten days uh, in silence, uh, just. Meditating from four in the morning till you know eight at night when I went to bed for ten days. Is that like um, in the book Eat, Pray, Love? Elizabeth, uh, can't think of her name now. The author she wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and she went to um, some place in India and did that silence meditation. It was very. Yeah, but- there, um, I'm not familiar with the book, but there this. These places are like all over, and I always recommend if you have um, the one thing I liked about it is, you know, they're um, they're Buddhist, but they don't preach anything. It's more mm-hmm. like, okay, you're gonna be in silence, and you're gonna deal with somebody that you probably don't really like much, and guess who that is? Yourself. <laughs> so it's kind of the whole experience is kind of like you being sit down in a small room with someone you really don't like and, yeah. and okay deal with it right. you know so you're right with the whole um thing starts withering away and and it stops being about what's around you because there is you know there, there's nothing around you except your own thoughts right which is it's, it's Funny enough, I've told people this story, and they, it scares the crap out of a lot of people. It, it does. It does. People are afraid to be alone. They distract themselves all the time. Um, you know, they can't drive to work without the radio on. They can't, um, you know, can't do anything in silence. I personally have learned to prefer silence over you know any kind I don't I'm even news free now um, I have been for about a year and it's definitely made me a happier person because whatever's happening in the world is not dictating my mood or or my mission you know if I were to listen every day as to the economy or the economic <laughs> you know position then I might get become afraid to pursue this mission 
that um you know that is a difficult journey in itself but then to have it dictated to me by the swings of of economy would just be i, I wouldn't get anywhere Right. Yeah, that was probably one of the best things that I ever did, too, was to uh, get rid of my TV. Um, I did that, what, three years ago now, something like that. <sighs> Two years ago. But, yeah, I wish I, I could do that. I can't get rid of the TV entirely because I, um, I, I love movies. and. Oh, oh I, I didn't get rid of the TV itself. I, I got rid of uh, cable. So I, oh. I still watch... I still watch movies, and that's all I do watch is is movies, you know. And so, but uh, thank God for Netflix. Oh yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Same here. Like we didn't even when we moved here. I moved here with my wife uh, about three years ago, and she wanted to buy a TV, and I just started breaking down how one expense led to the other. And I said, with the laptop, we get everything, all that, and. You know, it's like, okay, so we buy a TV, and then the programs that on there we're not going to really like, so we get cable. And now we have all these channels, but it's still, you don't watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. So we get a DVD player, and then, you know, we get it maybe up the, the, um, the cable a little more, so now we just spent so much money. And I get all of that just from the um, from the laptop, and mm-hmm. I watch what I want to watch when I want to watch it, not when some channel authority dictates. Like, you and know, you like, don't have to watch all those mind crafting commercials. Yeah, <laughs> they are mind numbing, yeah. and so so. I don't. I just. You know the reason that there are so many. Um, zombie shows and movies and things is a symptom or a symbol of this consumer mentality that has taken over the world. You know, we are just eating and eating and eating, consuming, consuming, and mindless consuming. And uh, that's why, you know, in deep in our cultural unconscious we're expressing this zombie you know fear of zombies right i think we're afraid of our this this monster of our consumer mentality mindless consumerism and what it's creating i think this is going to be a pretty subdued christmas i think people are starting to really get sick of the whole I mean, I've, they've been sick of the consumer and commercialization of of the holidays for a while, but now it's it's just ridiculous. Yeah. People, <laughs> you know, are they feel like it's ridiculous? Are no, you said, you, Ramon, you're in uh, Japan. Yeah. Is it the same it's, kind of culture there? It's worse, um, especially because you know they don't really celebrate. Um, well, they do and they don't. They took Christmas and completely uh, made it commercialized. So, for example, I asked um, on Tuesdays, I teach three kids um, between eight and nine years old, and I teach them English. And I was asking them, you know, like, okay, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for Christmas? And I was like, okay, what would you like to give your mom for Christmas? And they all looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> And wow. because in in Japan, gifts are only given between lovers and to kids. That's it. It's um, wow. So it's here in Japan. They don't really understand when I say ah. Oh, it's like it's. I hate Christmas in Japan because when it comes to the twenty fourth, twenty fifth, it's like okay. Here's Christmas now. What? And everybody still has to go to work, and you know it's like. And so here they're really good at uh, upping your spirits and really putting you in the Christmas mood. But then it's a huge letdown the day it comes. Hmm. Oh, Is that because they've lost totally lost the meaning, or don't know the meaning of it, what it's supposed to be? 
Yeah, there's there's well the whole thing of you know getting together with family because you know like many of us I I was I'm a recovering Christian so mm-hmm. um you know so I don't look at it in that way for me it's about getting together with friends and family and uh, and that's not there mm-hmm. but you know whoever thought of the idea of started bringing Christmas here knew what they were doing because knew it was only about the economic part of it mm-hmm. everything else about it has you know has no meaning yeah you know I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that that during our live show on Saturday I got pretty pessimistic and invented a little bit and what took me over the edge was on uh, Friday uh, I checked. I, I had some news articles come through my email. Ad, email, and one of them happened to be about the uh, all the people who were injured and trampled and stuff on Thanksgiving evening when all the stores opened up on Thanksgiving evening to start Black Friday on Thursday. <sighs> that took me over the edge. I was like, "You got to be kidding me." I mean, this is this is Thanksgiving. This is a day that we're supposed to be gathering with family, and we're supposed to think about gratitude, and we're supposed to be think we're supposed to be grateful for who and what and where we are, and grateful for our families, and grateful for the love we have in our lives. And they've turned it into a big commercial, uh, you know, acquisition day, you know, mass murder uh, day. Exactly, and there were people. So I, I said it can't be called Black Friday because it's not on Friday, number one. Uh, and black just doesn't fit. I think it red is more the color for it because of all the blood that is spilled of people that are, are just have no care for their fellow man and will trample over the, the lady that happens to be in front of them just to get at that $49 iPad. And you, you know, uh, it just where, where? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it just it it really it really it really made me look at society as a whole. You know, it, out of this whole seven bill seven billion people on this planet, and uh, the masses that were out on that day out there, you know, gathering stuff that they don't need. Uh, yeah, oh, geez, it just drove me up the wall. It was just like okay. Guys, are we really going to get it here? Are we getting it here? And so I, I spiraled down into the depths of darkness and got a little upset. And <laughs> yeah, there's then there's the other side of the family side when, um, I don't know about you guys, but when I was growing up, you know, in my late adolescence and early 20s, it, it always seemed like, the holidays, there was always a fight. You know, there's always fighting um, during the holidays. It's like you want to be home with your family. You want to come home and visit. But there's always a fight. Right. And now we're, we're raising, <laughs> you know, we're raising my um, husband's son. He's now almost 18. So he is definitely deep in the teenage angst era. Um and so it's like starting all over again. And we we got into this huge fight, to fit, big family fight on Thanksgiving. Just the three of us were here. And, and then finally there was enough. We settled down to, to, to eat. And Cody is his name. And my husband started to do the prayer and, and Cody goes, no, I, I don't like where this is going. Let me do it. And so he started to pray, and I could tell that he was listening to God, and he was praying with God's words. And I started crying because it was so beautiful to hear God through this kid who just about got me to be a murderous hmm. stepmother, you know, but then, <laughs> but then he, he, I, I just can't tell it melted. I literally, and I don't mean that I'm not using this word literal, um, frivolously. 
I literally felt my heart melting. And I, you know, I couldn't help but cry because it was a relief and a release of all of that pent up anger that had gone on during the fighting. I, and it was just so beautiful. And then he turns right around and starts getting snippy again and it starts over again. But, uh, but, I, but then at that point, I could do nothing but cry. I couldn't yell back at him because he had melted my heart. And uh, so then he came and comforted me because I was crying. And, you know, so it really was an opportunity that I had never imagined that family fighting could result in a family makeup and and a real sense of humanity just was experienced on Thanksgiving. It was it was beautiful. Mm, that does sound very beautiful. And it's mass you know, destruction. <laughs> there's there's right. There's a silver I, I'm, I'm laughing because I just love how um you know, in the 1950s and 60s, you had all these TV shows and the perfect family, the Leave it to Beavers mm. kind of thing. And it was like, and then you realize, so you thought growing up, like, well, maybe only my family's dysfunctional. <laughs> right. <else>. Right. <laughs> right. And yeah. then as you get older, you talk to other people, it's like, oh, you also come from a dysfunctional family too, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I was talking to a guy once who we were talking about that family fighting over the holidays and he said he his family finally decided to stop fighting but then they didn't have anything to talk about so it was just this <laughs> week. <laughs> it was like this weird oh. silence, you know, that the during the holidays after that. So. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know what? We have managed to uh, talk over this whole first hour already. It's just like, wow, where's the time go? Uh -huh. Oh, man. So, uh, in the next hour, I want to dig into some of the meat and potatoes out of the book and, uh, and uh, you know, hear some of, of what God's relayed to you through this work. And, uh, yeah, good stuff. Terrific. Good stuff. All right, guys. Well, if you are not a member yet, I would urge you to pop on over to the hundredth monkey radio dot com and become a member and help support Ramon and I and all that we're doing with the show. And I'd also urge you to go to uh, Sandra Sneed dot com and uh, take a look at her website. And uh, she's got a lot of good stuff on there. Let's, there's quite a few uh uh, there's some free downloads in there, and uh, you can actually get her book through there, which, which, uh, as I said in the first first of the the hour here, guys, uh, it has it definitely has some energy to it, and uh, I know quite a few few of you loyal listeners out there are quite em empathic yourselves, and you will, you know, you will feel the energy that I felt out of it. Uh, I'm sure so. Okay, so we're going to let Perry Mills, uh, what was that song, Ramon? Pick uh, up the call? Pick up, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, pick up the call. Uh, pick, you just want to disagree with me to yeah, disagree. Yeah, I do, just because it's Ramon. I'll disagree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. The love you deny is the pain you carry. And we will see you guys after the break. Stop and feel that you've been missing along the way. Put aside your petty fight and serve your dignity. You've got to show the heart that you've been hiding and set it free. There's just one goal. Trying to reach you, it serves yourself in. Pick up the call. Pick up the call. You gotta pick up the call. Pick up the call. It came the same way the very next day. The words they just took kept on coming through. Hard to conceive if you believe me. This is what you really want to do.
shy, excuse yourself and pick up the call. Pick up the call. You gotta pick up the call. Trying to meet you, an urgent message trying to reach you. The phone is ringing off the wall. So pick up the call. You gotta pick up the call. 